I want to start lecture today by talking about and defining two terms, de jure and de facto. They're both Latin terms and they relate to each other quite a bit. De is essentially the Latin word for of or from, and jure can be loosely translated into the law, right? We use the same root word for words like uh, judiciary, jury, or justice. So if something is de jure, it essentially means that it is of the law. De facto, on the other hand, isn't tied to the law. Instead, de facto stems from the root word factum, or just fact. Essentially, de facto means that something is simply a matter of fact. These two terms can add a lot of nuance to discussions about systems and forces that, although seemingly abstract and impersonal, directly impact the lives and experiences of people, both in the past and today. Even if those relationships aren't covered as well as we sometimes think they should be, be in news or popular media. For example, when we talk about systemic racism, segregation, and discrimination, it's important to recognize that there are both de jure and de facto forms to these forces. When we talk about the early civil rights movement, we have to acknowledge that organizations like the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, numerous others were incredibly successful at combating de jure racial discrimination and segregation. By waging determined campaigns for civil rights and equal opportunity out in the open and in public, by relying on peaceful demonstrations, sit-ins, pickets, boycotts, court challenges, and other strategies, the early civil rights movement was, over time, able to chip away at a system of de jure racial supremacy that was explicitly stated and legally enshrined across the country. At the same time, however, different, more pervasive forms of racial injustice were able to continue operating in spite of civil rights reforms. De facto discrimination and segregation broke through judicial boundaries by exploiting loopholes and new laws. And while Supreme Court decisions like Brown v. Board of Education and laws like the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act did a lot to challenge institutional racism in the United States. In many ways, the limitations of these laws ensured that de facto discrimination and injustice would continue, even if they had to assume new forms. Shirley Chisholm, the, black, the first black woman elected to US Congress, sums up the difference between these two terms in the quote here, right? She says, the difference between de jure and de facto segregation is the difference between open, forthright bigotry and the shame-faced kind that works through unwritten agreements between real estate dealers, school officials, and local politicians. But before we get too far into this thought, right, before we get too deep into this concept, let's step back and look at today's lecture in more general terms, right? Today we're going to be talking about rights and freedoms, the successes and failures of the earlier civil rights movement. And per the usual, I'm going to start off this lecture with a quote that I want everyone to keep in mind and kind of think about, right? This one is by Asada Shakur, whose autobiography you may have noticed we're reading for this class. She says, quote, nobody in the world, nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Now, by putting this quote here in this title slide, I'm not necessarily saying that she's right. I'm not saying that she's wrong but it is an evocative and powerful thought that she's putting forward that we should all think about, right? Is Asada Shakur right here? I challenge you to think about this and try and provide yourself with an answer, not only after watching this lecture, but also after doing our readings and reading the first part of her autobiography uh, before we come to class on Wednesday. But let's talk about topics for this lecture right here and now. We're gonna start talking uh, we're gonna start class today by looking at a few of these different organizations and leaders involved in the earlier civil rights movement. A lot of times people can assume that the civil rights movement was one monolithic fight to push for equality and justice, but this couldn't be further from the truth, right? Different groups of activists and speakers networked and cooperated with one another to be sure, but they all had their own opinions on how to fight for civil rights and how that fight would be won most effectively. And not everyone saw eye to eye, right? We'll take a moment to look at some of these more prominent groups and individuals uh, to get involved in the movement earlier on in its history. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the different strategies they used in different campaigns. 
Now, we're not going to be able to talk about everyone on the list that we provide in great detail today. We're gonna to be coming back in a future lecture to talk more about the civil rights movement um, later on as we kind of get into the late 1960s and the 1970s with the emergence of black power. After an albeit unfortunately brief introduction, we'll be taking a closer look at the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision and how that decision was implemented. We'll look specifically at one altercation between the governor of Arkansas and President Eisenhower over events that took place in Little Rock, Arkansas's state capital. We'll then shift focus to talk about the Montgomery bus boycott and considerable efforts put into the campaign to desegregate busing in cities like Montgomery, Alabama and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Far from being a reluctant participant in the fight for civil rights, Rosa Parks was a dedicated activist with the NAACP who knowingly put her life on the line to fight for equal treatment under the law. We'll also look at the March on Washington for jobs and freedom and consider how the movement sought to address both de jure and de facto discrimination and how campaigns like the Children's Crusade and the Selma Voting Rights Movement expanded the legal rights of African Americans nationwide before wrapping up with an evaluation of how effective the reforms won by this earlier phase of the civil rights movement were in combating racial injustice. But before we jump into the lecture, we should probably recap on a couple of points we've already made in class or have already read in some of our course readings just to make sure everyone's on the same page, right? Recall that many African-Americans left World War II with a sense of greater opportunity that was believed possible before the start of the war. During World War II, for example, the armed forces were uh, desegregated by executive order. Sorry, not during, but uh, closely after World War II. Armed forces are desegregated by executive order. The Tuskegee Airmen was the first all African-American aviation corps in American history, and they contributed to the war effort with stunning victories over the Axis, particularly against the Nazi Luftwaffe in Southern Europe over the skies of Italy. FDR signs Executive Order 8802 in 1941. After successful lobbying by the NAACP, union activists, and other civil rights advocates. This officially desegregates wartime defense industries and paves the way for many Black workers to secure well paying manufacturing jobs. I would be remiss in saying that uh, if I didn't say after the war, a lot of Black workers and other workers of color and women workers struggled to retain these jobs as post war hiring preferences began to reprioritize the employment of white men over marginalized groups. But there was a push for that equality in employment. There was a push for decent living standards for all people now. It's also an increased awareness that Black workers were responsible uh, for essential contributions to the war effort, both in industrial production as well as on the front lines. And this leads to increased acceptance and popularity of organizations campaigning for civil rights. The NAACP just serves as one example which had grown from 50,000 members in 1940 to nearly half a million at the end of the war. If you've been reading along in these United States, the, the Gilmore Institute textbook for class, you'll know that after the war, over 16 million veterans are returning from assignments in Europe, the Pacific and elsewhere. And many of them are afforded education stipends and home buying assistance through this recently passed GI Bill. Now, many of these benefits don't actually make it to Black veterans. Although the GI Bill applied evenly across racial lines at face value, right, if you're looking at it uh, without any of its uh, background or situational context and focus, it should apply to everyone. But the GI Bill didn't stop many universities from refusing to admit prospective students on the basis of race, turning away students if they were Black. The GI Bill doesn't prevent that. And it's also worth noting that uh, this was particularly true in the South. Um, well, this is particularly true in the South, institutional discrimination was nationwide and colleges in the North could be just as free to legally discriminate against black students if doing so benefited their bottom line. The GI Bill's provisions for home buying also eluded many African-American veterans, thanks in part to the racialized zoning codes that were embedded in the Federal Housing Authority's mortgage system. The Federal Housing Authority or FHA was Another one of FDR's New Deal programs was set up to provide home buyers with reliable long-term loans for buying a house. Uh, these would have, you know, in principle be safer for them than regular personal bank loans, which could be more volatile, could cost a lot more money, you know, you're responsible with paying it back uh, quicker. 
Black homeowners were excluded from these benefits because the FHA forbade banks from providing loans for housing that were in, uh, specifically seen as risky investments, right? If they were in a particular part of the city that was seen as risky or downtrodden, you can't loan money uh, for someone to buy a house there. Of course, oftentimes what made a property risky was the fact that it was located in a community of color, right? There's a considerable overlap between what the FHA said they wouldn't provide loans for and where African-American families, where other families of color, where other marginalized people are living in American cities. On the screen here, you'll see uh, a map. It's actually two maps. This first, the first map is uh, of predominant black communities in Detroit at the end of World War II. And it's actually superimposed on top of another map. And that's the city's red lines, uh, red lined districts, right? The areas that banks would not provide home loans for. That overlap is, is pretty noticeable, right? So African-Americans found themselves returning to overcrowded and segregated neighborhoods back home at the end of the war. But they did so with the desire to change that situation too. Now, I'm going to include a link to a video by The Root. You see a, a screen grab here. A link to a video by The Root on how impactful redlining has been for African-Americans and other communities of color. Um, that's going to be made available on our Courses Canvas page. I'm also gonna try to put a URL link uh, below in the video description here, if I can figure out how to do that. I encourage you all to check it out uh, and see just how deliberate and encompassing the practice of redlining was, and in many ways uh, still continues to be. Um, but I'm going to, to leave this video here for you to watch because they do a much better job of explaining this system than, uh, than I can reasonably throw together here. So we have our background. Right. Let's talk about some of these different civil rights organizations and some of their leaders. So we've established that although there have been some minor gains, African-Americans in the post-war United States still face substantial barriers to equality and employment, housing, access to education. And this is just among any other numbers of potential metrics we could gauge uh, social opportunity and civic opportunity by, right? So now we're gonna take a look at some of these organizations. We've mentioned the NAACP already. Uh, officially, um, the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, it emerges from World War II as the largest, most well-established civil rights organization. Now, like we've said, now, like we've said, there are many different organizations during this time, and they all work to advance the cause of civil rights in their own way, using and relying on their own strategies to win change. The NAACP, which had been founded all the way back in 1909, largely focused on using the legal approach to securing civil rights gains. The NAACP argued against existing segregationist policies and laws in the court system, often citing the violation of African Americans' constitutional rights by those laws in order to have them struck down by judges in state and federal courts. If that didn't work, they could also uh, be repealed by allied progressive politicians if the NAACP and other groups lobbied them to do so. A legal approach to winning change emphasizes peaceful protests, lobbying, and electoral participation is the best way to win reforms, and it's one of four main methods that social movements use to fight for change. We're going to come back and discuss uh, three, the other three methods in addition to this legal approach in the future when we talk about social movements, so keep that in mind. But for the early civil rights movement, we're just looking at, um, at legal, peaceful approaches to winning change that are used by these social movements. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, approached civil rights issues from a social activist perspective. Discrimination targeting African Americans needed to be addressed through peaceful protest using methods like strikes, demonstrations, and sittings, right? So they're not lobbying the courts directly. Uh, they might be involved in some litigation, but but by and large, uh, emphasizing direct action. SNCC was heavily involved in voter registration and canvassing throughout the South. Like the, NAA, uh, like the NAACP, SNCC favored this legal approach to the civil rights struggle, right? Uh, they didn't want revolution. They didn't want a, like separatism or anything. Unlike the NAACP though, SNCC was less involved in these kinds of Supreme Court battles. Like SNCC, the Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE, also 
few demonstrations and other forms of peaceful direct action is the best means for confronting racism and segregationist policies. Now, CORE is best known for its role in the Freedom Rides campaign, which protested segregation on interstate busing. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC, was a confederation of African-American and progressive churches that viewed racism and segregation as a moral crisis. Uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference argued that as Christians, church leaders, and their congregations, they all had a moral obligation to oppose segregation, fight discrimination and other forms of racial injustice, and work to repeal existing Jim Crow laws. The SCLC was the organization that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is most often associated with. And lastly, the labor movement is, is the last big one we're going to talk about today. The labor movement was also heavily involved in civil rights campaigns and worked to address issues of workplace justice through legal channels. The Congress of Industrial Organizations, a union alliance formed by left-wing organizations like the UAW, uh, USW, the uh, United Electric Workers, these kind of larger industrial unions uh, and others during the Great Depression attempted to lead mass organization drives across the Southern states after World War II. This was known as Operation Dixie. Operation Dixie uh, was an effort to unionize black and white workers together in integrated union locals, and it made considerable headway before the start of the Red Scare. After the passage of Taft-Hartley, though, and a lot of successive HUAC trials, um, a lot of labor activists were silenced, some of them being the most diehard union supporters in the Operation Dixie campaign. And when this was combined with a, a general uh, tying together of um, of communism with civil rights advocacy, right? Civil rights activists were red baited a lot of times. When you combine this with a resurgent KKK that was able to kind of operate um, and conduct terrorism with relative impunity throughout much of the South, um, the labor movement's progress stalls out. And eventually anti-labor state governments and organizations are able to kind of kick the unions back north for the most part. So we have a couple of organizations here and a couple of different approaches too, right? You can go through the courts, you can do direct action, you can lobby political representatives, you can work through churches, you can work through unions. All of these are legal approaches to winning, winning rights. I also think it's worth looking at individual leaders though too, right? So I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm, I want to go through a small, certainly non-exhaustive list of some of the major civil rights leaders that played uh, essential roles in the movement. Martin Luther King Jr., for example, was a Baptist minister and an activist. He became uh, one of the more visible spokespersons for and leaders of the civil rights movement. And this takes place after the Montgomery boycott, bus boycott in the 1950s. Uh, and it lasts until his eventual assassination in 1968. Greta Scott King was the wife of Martin Luther King Jr. And she worked to maintain the civil rights movement after 68 and critically sought to expand the scope of the civil rights movement to include feminists, LGBTQ people, and other marginalized communities as part of a wider push for social justice and dignity. Malcolm X was an American Muslim minister and a human rights activist. He's best known for a more controversial method in his advocacy for uh, securing the rights of black people. Pragmatic and decisive, his call for the ballot or the bullet encouraged many African-Americans to defend themselves and their rights if necessary. But it also unsettled a lot of white Americans who took the peaceful nature of the early civil rights movement for granted. Rosa Parks was an activist working for the NAACP in Alabama when she became a major, major figure in the civil rights movement, following her role in the Montgomery bus boycott. The US Congress uh, has at times called her the first lady of civil rights and the mother of the freedom movement. These are just some names that, uh, that have been given to her um, since kind of the zenith of this earlier phase of civil rights. Baird Rustin was an LGBTQ leader in the civil rights movement. He worked with A. Philip Randolph uh, on the March on Washington movement in 1941 to desegregate the defense industry. After the war, Rustin helped coordinate some of these freedom rides that, uh, that CORE was working on. He helped organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 
and also helped plan the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. A lifelong pacifist, Ruthven is often uh, credited with teaching Dr. King about Mahatma Gandhi's approach to civil disobedience and nonviolence. Stokely Carmichael, uh, later known as Kwame Ture, was the activist behind many of SNCC's voter registration drives. Later in life, he became a critical architect of the Black Power Movement and was even named honorary prime minister of the Black Panther Party. The Black Panthers we will be talking about in a future lecture. We also have uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, senior. He's a Baptist minister and politician. And he was a participant in the Montgomery to Selma marches of 1965 that made the Voting Rights Act possible. He later ran as a leading candidate for the Democratic president, uh, presidential nomination in 1984 and again in 1988. Fannie Lou Hamer, who you uh, see on the right, was a voting rights activist, women's rights activist, and community organizer. Hamer famously organized SNCC's Freedom Summer in Mississippi, and she also co-founded the National Women's Political Caucus, an organization that recruits, trains, and supports women of all races who wish to seek election to government office. Angela Davis is a legal activist and a professor at UC Santa Cruz. In 1970, Davis was charged with three capital felonies because individuals she knew or had known in the Black Panther Party were involved in a fatal takeover of a California courtroom. Davis was, was charged with conspiracy um, and a lot of other charges that really didn't have any sort of evidence behind them. Davis successfully defended herself against these allegations of conspiracy in court and has since served as a leading critic of the prison industrial complex and the nation's for-profit prison system. Now here you'll see a list of even more leaders, activists, and thinkers associated with the civil rights movement in some form or another. Space means that even still, some people have to be left off this list. If any of these names are, are unfamiliar to you, um, or you, you may have seen them, but you don't really know who these individuals were, I certainly encourage you to look them up. As much as I would love to talk about everyone on this list and more, um, we really just don't have the time to, to go as in depth as, we, as uh, I wish we could for a 75 minute lecture. There could be entire series of classes taught about the civil rights movement, um, but for our purposes, these are some of the main, the names that you should at the very least be familiar with. So we have a good summary of the post-war situation and a list of some of the major organizations and individuals involved in the civil rights movement. Right? Now we should look at how these organizations fight against racial injustice to win meaningful, meaningful reforms. After the Taft-Hartley Act leads to Operation Dixie's defeat, the next major battle that we see in the push for civil rights comes when the NAACP challenges segregation in education at the US Supreme Court. Now, prior to this point, many schools across the United States adhered to a policy of separate but equal, meaning that school segregation was considered constitutional so long as white and black school, school, uh, white and black school children were theoretically, at least, enjoying the same resources and access to opportunities in their education. It's worth pointing out that a lot of times we associate separate but equal with the deep South, the Jim Crow South. This was a nationwide issue. Uh, and you have schools in New Hampshire, you have schools in Oregon and California, just as you have schools in Mississippi that are excluding students uh, from opportunities on the basis of sex, on the basis of race, on the basis of ethnicity. The NAACP was able to demonstrate that separate but equal was unconstitutional by showing the Supreme Court that, contrary to the law, segregated schools for African-American students were routinely underfunded, undersupplied, and understaffed, violating their rights as American citizens. The NAACP used the expert testimony of sociologists and psychologists who were able to further show that the policy of separate 
but equal was psychologically damaging to non-white children. This was done by using what the NAACP referred to as the doll test, which sought to demonstrate the effects of racism on students and which left of, uh, which observers viewed as incredibly disturbing. African-American students were asked in front of courts to choose between several dolls and tell observers which one they preferred. The dolls were all identical except for their skin color. African-American students routinely chose the white dolls, demonstrating to the court how segregation affected students' concept of self-value and self-esteem. As a result of the NAACP's legal work, the Supreme Court unanimously agreed in their decision to order that public schools be desegregated. This was the Brown v. Board of Education case. Thurgood Marshall, who argued the case, would later serve on the Supreme Court as its first African-American Chief Justice. This decision was resisted uh, in many parts of the country, though. After the 1954 Brown v. Board decision, the NAACP began registering and enrolling African-American students to previously all-white schools. In rural Arkansas, a pro-segregationist governor named Orville Fabus vowed to block the integration, integration of the Central High School in Little Rock after the NAACP registered nine African-American students speaking classes there. This is in the fall of 1957. The governor, or this uh, Orville Favis gentleman, called the Arkansas National Guard to Little Rock to keep this group of students, dubbed the Little Rock Nine, from entering the high school. For three days, the students tried to enter the high school, but were turned back. And each day, they were turned back with no protection to angry, jeering crowds that had gathered in front of the high school to protest the students. The Little Rock School District, to its credit, and Ike Eisenhower, the president, both repudiated the governor and called on him to follow the orders of the Supreme Court. When he refused to do this, Eisenhower was forced to order the 101st Airborne into Little Rock to escort the Little Rock Nine and guard them while they attended classes. The Little Rock Nine suffered harassment, verbal threats, and physical abuse. This was directed at them by racist white students. One student, Minnie Jean Brown, who you see on the top right there, was suspended for the remainder of the school year after she defended herself when several white students attacked her in the cafeteria. The remaining eight students of the Little Rock Nine made it to the end of the school year in 1958, though, and this paved the way for further integration. So all is good, right? Not exactly. The legacy of the Little Rock Nine is a tenuous one, especially when we reintroduce these two concepts, de jure and de facto. While many high schools occupied by all white students were forced to integrate, white flight away from cities and the outgrowth of suburban communities nominally closed off to African-American families through this redlining practice that we discussed earlier and other similar, similar practices meant that throughout the 1960s and 1970s, many schools ended up resegregating, even though laws which, even though there were laws on the books now that had maintained that school segregation should be struck down, that it was unconstitutional. This newer de facto segregation was difficult to fight because instead of being enshrined in the law, instead of overturning a law or striking a law down in the courts, this new de facto segregation was maintained by economic barriers and social barriers that prevented African-American families access to more affluent suburban school districts. Furthermore, in states like Virginia, some counties simply closed their public schools in favor of providing families with state vouchers for private school alternatives, right? If you're going to make us integrate public schools, we'll close the public schools and we'll just have all of our families uh, use a state allowance to enroll their children in private schools. Private schools, it's worth mentioning at the time, were still legally allowed to discriminate based on race. And practices like these would last in many places until laws regarding public accommodations eventually were amended to prohibit them. This wouldn't be until like the mid to late 1960s. So Brown v. Board of Education is a major step forward, but in a lot of ways, discrimination and racism are able to adapt. 
at around the same time as the NAACP was fighting to make sure schools would follow the Brown v. Board decision. The organization also took on discrimination on public transportation. On December 5th, 1955, Rosa Parks got on a Montgomery City bus to ride home after her shift at work. Now existing laws in Montgomery stated that African-American riders had to surrender their seat to white riders if they were asked to do so. And the law also further restricted African-American riders from sitting in seats at the front of the bus, which were conveniently closer to the door, right? Those seats were reserved for white patrons. Now Parks took her seat toward the back of the bus when she was approached by a white man who ordered her to give her seat up to him. Rosa Parks, who had been working with the NAACP to challenge segregation in Alabama, peacefully refused. So the bus was pulled over and stopped until police could arrive to arrest her. Rosa Parks, like many African-Americans and progressives at the time, was angered by the repeated injustices perpetrated against the black community in the Jim Crow South. The acquittal of, murder, of the murderers of Emmett Till had occurred just months before Parks' refusal to surrender her seat and had generated widespread public outrage. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old teenager from Chicago who had been visiting family in Mississippi during his summer vacation. And while he was at a local store in Mississippi, a white woman accused him of whistling at her. In response to the incident, a crowd gathered outside the house of Till's family, dragged Till from his bed, and lynched him from a tree after brutally beating and torturing him. An all-white jury acquitted the men accused of murdering Till in August of 1955. In 2017, Carolyn Bryant, the woman who had accused Emmett Till of whistling at her, finally came forward and admitted that she made the whole thing up. Now, a lot of times people tend to misrepresent Rosa Parks' protest as kind of this impromptu act that simply uh, and kind of accidentally ballooned into a, a greater civil rights campaign, right? This, the conventional story use, usually goes that Parks had just gotten off a long shift at work. Uh, she was an old lady. She was very tired. And she didn't want to move. And she simply just con consigned to being arrested instead of giving up her seat, right? She was too tired. But some parts of this narrative could not be further from the truth. For one, Rosa Parks was in her early 40s at the time of her arrest, and contrary to how she's sometimes presented as stumbling into the civil rights movement on accident, Parks was a committed NAACP activist who not only intended to protest Montgomery's busing segregation laws, but did so out of a dedicated political conviction. Parks later reflected back on the moment and said, quote, I thought of Emmett Till, and I just couldn't go back. Blake, the white writer, said, why don't you stand up? And Parks responded, I don't think I should have to stand up. There had been earlier arrests following similar instances where African-American writers like 15-year-old Claudette Colvin, who you see at the top center there. She also refused to surrender her seat. The treatment of these protesters at the hands of law enforcement further outraged the community, making a successful boycott of Montgomery City busing system a possibility. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, civil rights activists boycotted that city's busing system and won some legal reforms. The NAACP believed that a boycott in Alabama might lead to similar change. And so leading civil rights groups came together to launch a boycott of the Montgomery bus system. A lot of times people look at Rosa Parks and say, well, it was kind of an, an accidental uh, mistake that she got on this bus and refused to move. But the Montgomery bus boycott, it is worth remembering, came after months of planning, and it was only made possible by dedicated political activists who were willing to risk their safety to fight for justice. Now, the argument behind a boycott is basically uh, and the argument behind, I guess, the Montgomery bus boycott specifically, is that by finding alternative ways of getting around and refusing to provide the city of Montgomery with bus fare from the African-American community, the city might be forced to reform its rules about segregation on buses. Or else the entire busing system is just gonna become a financial liability, right? 
Participants who had cars and trucks would drive one another to work, to grocery stores, to other locations throughout the city. And their efforts were so successfully coordinated that at the boycott's height, an entirely independent transit schedule was established by boycott participants so that nobody would be forced to take uh, Montgomery City buses if they didn't want to. Without the income from African-American fares, the Montgomery City buses quickly began operating on a deficit, right? In order to run the buses, it was costing more money than what they were getting in bus fare. Now, instead of listening to boycotters' demands, the city was instead quick to respond with threats and intimidation. In 1956, at the height of the boycott, 89 boycott leaders and carpool drivers were indicted for conspiring to interfere with a business. This was made possible under a 1921 ordinance that had been earlier used to, uh, to combat labor unrests and strikes. You can use it on civil rights boycott leaders too. Rather than wait to be arrested, uh, boycott leaders turned themselves in as an act of defiance. Among those who turned themselves in was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He and Bayard Rustin come up with this idea of if you're going to demand that we come in uh, to jail for, for leading a peaceful protest, well, then we're going to come to you. We're not going to resist a civil disobedience. And not only that, uh, that we're not going to resist, but we're going to come down to the jail hells dressed to the nines in our Sunday vests, and we're going to make a circus out of this. The police end up looking bad. They don't have enough room for everyone. And the civil rights movement is able to emerge from this attempt to intimidate and suppress the boycott. They emerge from this effort uh, looking all the better. Because of the way that this city's uh, crackdown backfires, the city of Montgomery faces in, like a, a increased pressure across much of the country as public opinion begins to side with the boycott. As the boycott continues, the NAACP challenged Montgomery's segregationist laws in the court system, just as they had done with Brown v. Board. And in 1956, the Supreme Court declares that racial segregation laws for buses was unconstitutional. This was in the Supreme Court decision, Browder versus Gale. Now the Montgomery bus boycott officially ended after 381 days, at, towards the end of, of 1956, it was on December 20th. This happens after the city of Montgomery officially passes an ordinance allowing African-Americans equal rights on buses but really they had been forced to pass this ordinance in order to keep up with the Supreme Court's decision in Browder v. Gale. The bus boycott was a monumental victory and helped solidify individuals like Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks as civil rights movement icons. Historians also point to the boycott as kind of the starting point for the rise of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. Like Brown v. Board and the Little Rock Nine, however, de facto discrimination and segregation would go on to complicate the struggles for justice, even as de jure segregation, right, this of the law segregation, was dealt another blow. White residents of Montgomery did not accept the civil rights movement's victory peacefully. Following the integration of bus services, several Klansmen bombed five black churches in the area, and after they were captured and put on trial for their role in the attacks, all five Klansmen were acquitted, right? They weren't charged with the crime, they were found not guilty. A number of unsuccessful assassination attempts were made against both Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks shortly after the boycott ended. And Rosa Parks was receiving so many death threats and hate mail and attempts on her life that she was forced to leave Montgomery and relocate to Detroit. Additionally, uh, one would be remiss if they didn't mention the fact that many of the same social and economic barriers that stifled black home ownership and access to quality education, right after Brown v. Board of Education. These forces are also present at the heart of continued racial disparities in access to transportation. Bus services remain poorly funded, even while state and national governments spend billions of dollars on road maintenance, disproportionately benefiting white car owners. So again, we see how de facto 
discrimination and de facto segregation, de facto racism is starting to supplant the de jure discrimination that is being struck down in courts. Let's talk about the March for Jobs and Freedom. Now, building off of earlier successes seen in the civil rights movements, calls began to be made for a national law that would protect the rights of African Americans and other vulnerable communities, regardless of state or city boundaries. This led activists like Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph to coordinate with Martin Luther King Jr. to unite various civil rights organizations, labor unions, religious groups, and others to pressure the government to act in defense of civil rights and oppose institutional racism. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom was the end result of this coordination. Sometimes people were referred to it simply as the Great March or the March on Washington, but regardless of the name we use, this march sees a massive turnout. Over 300,000 people traveled to Washington, D.C. to demand equal rights under the law, making the march the largest coordinated demonstration for human rights in American history up until that point. Now, a lot of times, if you ask people why the 1963 March on Washington is so important, they'll usually let you know that it was, it was the place where Martin Luther King delivers his I Have a Dream speech. And this is a huge point in the civil rights movement. It's a huge point in American history. But behind the scenes, the civil rights movement is also starting to change here, right? Specifically, more activists are calling attention to the ways that de facto segregation continues to place limits on the rights of African Americans and other people who are disenfranchised under the political system. Despite many of the disagreements held between different civil rights organizations, varying groups are able to come together and create a unified set of goals for the civil rights movement going forward. This list I have uh, on the right side of the screen for you. And as you can see, many of the demands put forward by the March organizers went beyond the set of legal codes that provided for the foundation of de jure discrimination. And they called for meaningful action that would target de facto discrimination as well. An increase to minimum wage you'll see is on there job training programs, expanded labor laws that would erode some of the economic barriers that Black families continue to face, greater enforcement of existing laws designed to prevent discrimination would make using loopholes to continue with de facto forms of discrimination more difficult. Even the name of the march, the March for Jobs and Freedom, attests to the fact that organizers were recognizing that de jure segregation might be starting its decline, right? It might be push, being pushed out of the limelight, but de facto discrimination through uh, economic and social barriers was still a pressing problem. Freedom, but also jobs and freedom. Following the success of the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom, the civil rights movement focused its attention on guaranteeing the voting rights of African Americans in the Deep South, where substantial legal barriers were still in place that limited the ability of African American communities to participate in electoral politics. A lot of these laws did so um, in kind of a de jure, but not explicitly de jure kind of way where they would target race without mentioning race as a excluded category directly. So laws were being used uh, to prevent participation of African Americans from voting, even though the law wasn't specifically uh, stated that was doing it that way. And if you're asking, how do you keep someone from voting without saying in a law, this type of person can't vote? Well, there's actually a lot of ways. Methods used to disenfranchise African-American voters often varied, uh, but segregationists and government could rely on them all the same, uh, kind of uh, to suit their needs, depending on situation. Poll taxes and literacy tests were used to drive down black participation in elections, right? So if you, you need to pay a tax in order to, uh, to vote this year, a lot of times these things would be, uh, would roll over. So if you didn't pay the poll tax the last three years and you wanted to vote this year, you have to pay four years of poll taxes. Literacy tests, we're going to put in a lot of words that are, um, that are taught in 
in schools that are nominally attended by white children, but not by black children. We're going to make this literacy test very inaccessible to certain groups of people, depending on sociological data. Segregationists outside of the law could turn to violent terrorist organizations like the KKK to prevent voter registration drives. If all of these hurdles were somehow cleared, then state officials could simply move polling stations further away from African American communities. And if someone happens to overcome all of these barriers, well, it's worth noting that racist white Southerners who controlled their state's political parties often held closed whites only primary elections. And this made sure that African American candidates or candidates friendly to the civil rights cause would never make it onto the general ballot, regardless of if they were a Democrat or a Republican. Now in 1965, civil rights groups attempted, attempted to organize a mass march from the small town of Selma, Alabama to the state capital in Montgomery. This was done to protest the state's uh, the state of voting rights in Alabama and other states in the Deep South. On the first day of the march, unarmed protesters were intercepted by state police and white mobs as they crossed the border into Montgomery County. Beaten with clubs and fired at with tear gas canisters, the marchers were eventually dispersed when mounted police charged into the crowd on horseback. The event, known as Bloody Sunday, drew international condemnation and around the world, American allies expressed anxieties and worries about the state of democratic rights in the United States. So the US is starting to come under international pressure over the way it's handling civil rights. Two more attempts to reach Alabama's state capital were made. The second attempt was also repulsed, but with much less bloodshed than on Bloody Sunday. The third attempt, which was covered extensively by the international press, successfully reached the state capitol building and a demonstration could be held. The whole world was watching is, a, is one axiom that you could use to describe this situation. The treatment of peaceful protesters, especially on Bloody Sunday, came as a shock to many Americans who believed in 1965 that issues of race had long been settled. They hadn't, and they haven't. The public outcry over the suppression of African-American protesters finally compelled the government into signing the voting rights, protect, signing voting rights protections into law. Let's talk about the legacy of the early civil rights movement. As a direct result of the early civil rights movement, several sweeping reforms aimed at addressing institutional racism were passed. Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court decision that ended the right uh, of the state to segregate public schools is just one of four major changes in the law that has its origins in civil rights activism. Linda B. Johnson, who became president after FD, uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination in 1963, signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law. This outlawed discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in public accommodations or employment, right? You can't just fire or refuse to hire someone because they're an African-American. You can't refuse to hire someone just because they're a woman. Up until 1964, this was not the law of the land. The Civil Rights Act, it should be known, came as a direct result of the effort of the efforts that activists put into the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And in response to the massive outpouring of public anger over the treatment of African-American protesters, in the Selma Voting Rights Movement, Lyndon Johnson introduces and signs the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And this placed federal oversight over the electoral process in areas where discrimination had remained a barrier to political participation, right? If state governments aren't going to protect the rights of their voting public, regardless of race, the federal government will intervene. In 1964, two thirds of states in the United States ratified the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. The 24th Amendment, if you don't already know, makes the poll tax, along with any other fees that are used uh, for, as a requirement to participate in public elections, makes it unconstitutional, right? You can't force someone to pay in order to vote. In 
In conjunction with these larger campaigns, restaurant and lunch counter sit-ins coupled with public support led many businesses to desegregate their businesses before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Organized by groups like SNCC and CORE, these sit-ins led to massive arrests of protesters, but were successful in the long term because of the dedication of activists and organizers. Freedom Rides, treks where inter integrated buses left northern states to tour southern states, were the targets of shootings and fire bombings, but these also compelled the government to take segregation on, make uh, segregation on interstate busing illegal. So activism led to direct change. Alabama's Birmingham campaign, also known as the Children's Crusade, similarly forced the city to drop many of its segregationist laws before the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. While the early civil rights movement provided for many gains, some critics of the movement's early strategies point out that these gains were too hard fought, that changes came too slowly, and many of the changes in the law that were made were too easily circumvented through legal loopholes. Essentially, that these efforts limited de jure discrimination, but de jure discrimination was simply able to change forms to become de facto discrimination. This slow and gradual pace of change would eventually lead to the creation of new groups that argued for a more confrontational approach to politics and that placed more value on African-American self-reliance and self-defense than on peaceful integration. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. for his efforts in, uh, in alleviating the suffering of African-American people and promoting peace and fighting racial injustice was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. He was shot by a gunman in Nashville, Tennessee while supporting a sanitation workers strike in that city. Still yet, the staying power of many of these gains has also been called into question. In 2015, 50 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, many of its provisions were not renewed by the federal government and were allowed to expire. Civil rights activists today have pointed to renewed policies adopted in the South since 2015 that they say systematically prevent African-American participation in elections. These policies include more strict voter ID laws and the gerrymandering of, of electoral districts. And again, the closure of polling locations that are nearby or in communities of color. If you don't know what gerrymandering is, um, I have a couple of graphics or images here on the left side of the screen to kind of give you a general idea. The basic premise is that you're able to manipulate your congressional representative maps. Um, and by doing so, you can take uh, you can take a state that is nominally leaning toward one party and make it so that its representatives are primarily of a different party, right? So what are the takeaways from today's lecture? Well, we've seen how racial injustice and discrimination can take many forms, and we've looked at how organizations fighting for civil rights were able to effectively employ a number of strategies to win reforms and win access to greater equality and opportunity. These opportunities had been beyond the reach of many Africans and other uh, African Americans and other Americans simply on the basis of color or sex or ethnicity. We've seen how these well-intentioned reforms, one at such difficulty and hardship though, were so quickly circumvented as those in power shifted from de jure discrimination to de facto discrimination. Racism and racial injustice still exist. That's not a political opinion of mine, that is a qualitative fact. Racism can draw on different sources of power than it did before but is still able to produce the same effects. Even though segregation in the law is illegal, socioeconomic barriers can be put in place that maintain a system of segregation. The inability of the earlier civil rights movement to secure, for, uh, to secure form reforms that could not be circumvented led activists to pursue other avenues. As we get closer, further into the 1960s and into the 1970s, a lot of the political activism we're going to look at is going to be less peaceful. And if you want to understand why, you have to look at how long and drawn out and painful the fight for civil rights was earlier and how quickly its victories were undermined. 
the civil rights movement is ongoing. It is still going on today. And if the last, uh, if the year of 2020 didn't, didn't affirm that, I would really challenge you to look and see what the demands of civil rights activists today are and how closely they are running parallel to the, act, the demands and desires of civil rights activists of the 1950s and 1960s. Now, if these topics are particularly interesting to you, uh, then you might want to consider posting on the discussion board response, the discussion board uh, prompt that's been posted that kind of links up with this lecture, right? That one, of course, will ask, how should we as a society, how should America confront challenges posed by de facto racial discrimination and de facto racist segregation, de facto racial injustice, if the civil rights movement of the past, well, appropriately and successfully challenging de jure forms of discrimination could oftentimes fall short in challenging de facto discrimination, discrimination that exists outside the confines of the law. How do we tackle that issue? If this is a subject that you care deeply about, consider responding to that prompt. Or of course, if you don't want to, there are a host of other responses that you can reply to as well. By Friday, make sure you post two of those discussion board responses, right? Those longer kind of 300 word responses. And after you take some time, or if you're responding later, you know, of course you can go right away, make sure you, re you reply to some of your classmates. Do they bring up points that you think are particularly interesting or insightful? Do you have disagreements with their approach or their understanding of certain issues? As always, you'll wanna keep these conversations respectful, right? But if someone sees things different from you, having those kinds of exchanges can be very mind opening and they can make us see things from a perspective we had never considered before. So I encourage you to reach out to your classmates and have some of those discussions. Of course, you'll also wanna stay on top of your readings. Make sure that by the end of the week, you read chapter two of the textbook, These United States. Also make sure uh, that if you are not finishing your autobiography by the end of this week, that you are finishing it sometime uh, over the weekend or early into next week. Because keep in mind that next Friday, the Friday after this one, the end of week four, we will be turning in those midterm uh, book reviews, right? So make sure you're staying on top of that reading. Again, if reading these entire books in such a short length of time is particularly challenging to folks, I'm an auditory learner myself, just a reminder that those, uh, that those audio options are available to you, right? Asada and Autobiography, we have the YouTube reading with that commentary. Um, we also have uh, Ron Kovic's Born on the 4th of July uploaded as a PDF. So if you have Microsoft Edge or, or Google Chrome, you can have your web browser read those books to you, even as you're doing things like doing the dishes, uh, maybe cleaning up your dorm or your apartment. Feel free to mount multitask, right? We're all millennials and Gen Z, we know how that goes. And then lastly, of course, uh, if you missed out on last week's uh, extra credit opportunity or if you took advantage of it and you want even more extra credit points, don't forget that uh, the second extra credit film review will also be due by the end of the day, Friday. This one moves forward a little bit in time. We're not talking about World War II anymore. We're talking about the Cold War. Uh, this documentary comes, uh, it was released in several stages. Uh, the first uh, stage came out in 1954. It was about 20 minutes long, but they added on to it over time. And its final version was released in 1962. It's called Red Nightmare, Freedom and You. It's one of these very uh, quintessentially American public service style documentaries that talks about the virtues of voting, of going to and joining at your union hall, going to PTA meetings, being civically involved uh, for the health and security and defense of the nation. What are your opinions on that? What do you think people uh, living in the 1960s and the 1950s would have thought watching something like this compared to how we might view something like this now? Let me know your thoughts. Of course, this is certainly optional. If you don't wanna do that film review, please don't feel fresh, uh, pressured to do so. I know we're all juggling a lot of things, um, even though it is the summer. We, you know, we're still coming out of a pandemic. We're still kind of uh, in very much a, a period of recovery for a lot of us, right? So. If the extra credit film review is kind of uh, beyond your capacity right now, don't worry, uh, that won't reflect any, uh, any negativity on you, right? Of course, uh, what also won't reflect negatively on you is reaching out and asking for help. If you have any questions, concerns, or if you just need to talk to someone about class, about 
uh, scholastics, let me know. I'm a Canvas message or an email away. Uh, just to reiterate, those Canvas messages will send me a push notification on my phone. I can usually respond a little bit quicker to those, um, but I will also respond to emails as well. So if you do have anything, any questions, any concerns, if you need any uh, any help at all, uh, don't don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I am your instructor. I'm here to support you. Uh, so do uh, don't be afraid to reach out.